Great. I think we are ready to start now. And I would like to uh, begin this session with a land acknowledgement. As the treaty peoples, we all share um, a duty to respect and to give care to the territories we live on and honor the many treaties and agreements that govern the land. From time immemorial, indigenous nations have coexisted on these lands where we now all reside, forming relationships both among nations and with the lands and the waters that support them and upholding treaties which continue to have importance to this day. And so we acknowledge and respect the ancestors and current caretakers of the territories, as well as our individual responsibilities under all existing treaties. So we're all in different parts of the province or outside of Ontario, possibly here in Ottawa, I'm in uh, on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people uh, who have lived on this land um, since time immemorial, and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to present in this territory. Um, I would also like to acknowledge today Ontario Ministry of uh, Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs for supporting the development and delivery of the training session, which will highlight uh, research that was conducted uh, over the past two years with the engagement of the Council of the Great Lakes Region and financial support from First Power. Now, a few words of uh, introduction of the Climate Risk Institute team that will be hosting and facilitating today's session. I'm Anna Zetseva, I'm an advisory and technical services liaison at CRI with background in uh, climate science, geospatial technologies, and I have um, over the past few years conducted multiple climate change risk assessments, a lot of them in the agricultural sector. Paul Cobb, um, we're lucky to have him with us today. He's the manager of training services at CRI, who has uh, worked for over 20 years in the fields of climate change mitigation and adaptation, and is now coordinating um, CRI's work with multiple partners and experts to develop and deliver professional uh, development programs for engineers, for planners, and other professionals. Um, Alyssa Hill is our um, climate adaptation and resiliency analyst with the CRI. Uh, she has a master's degree in climate change and through her studies and work experience has uh, been involved in initiatives related to climate action, equity, sustainability, as well as adaptation, mitigation and governments in different parts of Canada. At today's session, we will go over a number of themes that are related to uh, vulnerability assessment and adaptation response planning in the agricultural context. We will begin by looking at uh, climate change data and modeling fundamentals, followed by an investigation of climate trends and projections, hazards and impacts that are most relevant for the agricultural sector in, uh, in Gray, Bruce and Huron counties, and also more broadly in uh, southwestern southern Ontario. Key steps and considerations on assessing climate-related risks and opportunities will also be highlighted. We will pause about halfway through the session to reflect on the material presented. And we'll finish with a hands-on group activity on identifying, assessing, and applying climate data um, in a climate adaptation context. Please feel free at uh, any time throughout the session to um, if you have any questions, add them in the chat box and we will be pausing to answer them a couple of times um, during the presentation. Objectives of today's session include uh, being able to understand anticipated climate change impacts and hazards that are directly relevant um, to a sector and region and also be able to navigate, access and use climate data to support uh, planning and operations. Before we dive into today's content, uh, let us see um, who has uh, joined us today by filling out a uh, brief poll. Just bear with me for a second. So it should now, yeah, I see that it has popped up on your screens. Mm 
maybe in the chat people can uh, can put either what CA they're with or if they've put other, maybe uh, give us a little bit more detail in the chat. Great, so largely we can see that we have uh, um, members from conservation authorities and other organizations and yes, your most welcome to introduce yourselves in the chat and give more details. As we go through the topics uh, that we've reviewed in the agenda, references will be made to research that was conducted over the past two years um, as I mentioned, uh, with the help from and support from uh, Council of the Great Lakes Region and Bruce Power, and we will draw from that assessment's results to talk about weather trends and projections, as well as key impacts and possible adaptation actions to improve the resilience of agricultural sector in the region to the changing climate. So as with any assessment, um, the goal of our work was to understand potential climate related risks and help stakeholders make informed decisions about adaptation. This map shows um, the study area within Southern Ontario with three counties marked with um, stars. Um, agriculture is an important industry in the region with um, uh, livestock production and cash crop production being um, dominant. Um, specialty crops like apples are also grown primarily in Gray County, and there are regional differences in both crop and livestock production that reflect soil and climate characteristics in the region. Through our work, we have uh, assembled and reviewed literature and developed risk scenarios for key uh, climate hazards, hosted uh, individual and group stakeholder engagement, and lastly developed risk products based on our research and the feedback that we have received. For the purposes of the assessment, risk was defined as uh, the potential for consequences where something of value is at stake and where the outcome is uncertain. Um, the climate impact pathway begins with uh, climate hazards like drought or extreme rainfall that impact agriculture commodities like crops or livestock infrastructure um, as well. And then these impacts can have consequences across multiple categories like financial loss or environmental damage. As shown in the bottom figure, risk is the product of the system's exposure to a hazard and its magnitude is linked to the likelihood of a hazard occurring and then the severity of consequence. Some key lessons we learned from that assessment are that the main impacts to agricultural production are caused by drought, precipitation, and heat events. Information on risk, when presented, needs to be supported with information on solutions. And we have developed some climate risk products to raise awareness, support planning, design, and implementation of resilience measures, which include the risk registry, climate risk infographics, and then a case study series on best management practices in agriculture. With this uh, brief intro, I will pass it over to Paul to walk us through climate change data and modeling fundamentals, as well as climate trends and projections. Paul, I will stop. Thank you. And I will just uh, get my screen share going here in just one second. Um, how's that look? My, uh, am I on the right thing? So I already got a nod from Anna there. Okay. Um, well, thanks everybody, and thanks for getting this started, Anna. So I'm going to lead us through uh, the next couple of sections. Uh, this one, just uh, a review of climate change, um, just some key concepts, uh, as well as kind of reviewing exactly what the climate data. Um, what climate data is available, what climate models actually are, um, what they can. 
can't tell you, and uh, and then we'll get into uh, some discussion around climate impacts as well. And then we'll come back to Anna again a little bit later um, to go into you know how that uh, how that all feeds into risk assessments and, and adaptation planning. Okay, so um, the smallest group. So feel free to like add questions uh, in the chat box as we go. Um, Anna and Alyssa will keep an eye on that and. Feel free to interrupt me um, if you want to get an explanation on anything or want to elaborate or have a question. Um, yeah, so feel free to add, add those questions in the chat box as we go. Um, I guess you can use the raise hand function there too. And, uh, and my colleagues might, uh, Anna and Alyssa might be able to uh, just interrupt me and we can get back to that. Okay, so the first thing is really just, you know, making sure we have a common definition of what we mean by climate um, as opposed to weather. Uh, so climate is, in a general sense, is usually defined as the average uh, weather in a, uh, in a particular area. Um, more rigorous definition might be that the, the mean and the variability of relevant indicators over a period of time ranging from months to thousands or millions of years. Um, traditionally, um, and relevant to this sector, is when we talk about sort of climate averages, uh, we often talk about the span of uh, or the average of those variables over a period of 30 years. So that's sort of a common definition of, um, uh, of a climate period as defined by the World Meteorological Organization. And so climate change is when that mean and that variability uh, shift due to external forces, including anthropogenic or human caused forcing. Um, so what we, mean, uh, what we mean there is the um, on the anthropogenic Forcing side is we mean basically the burning of fossil fuels uh, and the addition of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. But we do also mean changes in land use that affect um, what we call carbon sinks. So that's the ability of things like the soil, wetlands, uh, and forests to absorb carbon. Uh, so Earth's climate um, obviously is determined by sort of that balance between incoming energy from the sun and outgoing energy uh, from Earth. So that balance is affected by a few different things. Um, if we look at the look at the chart there, obviously increases or decreases in solar radiation would affect um, that balance and that uh, that relationship. Changes in solar radiation. Uh, you know, such as clouds, those sorts of things, they tend to, um, could affect those balances uh, as well. And then increases or decreases in the infrared radiation. So that's uh, emitted by the earth into space. And so that's how much of the warmth from earth is sort of getting back out into space um, as well. So um, we know that while there are changes in solar radiation, so that's the energy from the sun, that is certainly not uh, the driver of current climate. Uh, it has had an influence uh, over the last hundreds of thousands of years and leads to some uh, sort of gentle cycles, but it is not the driver of what is happening right now. So we know um, that that balance between incoming and outgoing energy is being altered because we're changing uh, the elements within the atmosphere and we're changing that element of radiation. Uh, and so because we're changing the composition of gases in the atmosphere, we're changing the balance and the amount of energy that's trapped by our atmosphere. So there are a number of different anthropogenic uh, gases that trap heat. So we think primarily of carbon dioxide, um, but also there are um, other important greenhouse gases, uh, such as methane uh, is another sort of important one, uh, but a number of other industrial gases uh, also cause, uh, also contribute to that um, warming. An important little um, bit of information there is that each uh, we often or we can refer to how much warming an individual sort of molecule of a greenhouse gas causes as its global warming potential. So some of those gases that I've just mentioned, uh, carbon dioxide, methane, uh, some fluorocarbons that are industrial gases, some trap more heat on a per molecule basis than others. Um, so that's just a, an important little part there um, to consider or just to make note of. Okay, so yeah, while carbon dioxide, and we can go back hundreds of thousands of years sort of measuring this through a variety of different sort of measures um, in, the, in the historical and, uh, and uh, scientific records, um, you know, everything from ice cores to uh, tree samples. And there are ways that they've gone back, you know, hundreds of thousands of years to determine carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere over time. 
So scientists have discovered and know that those carbon dioxide levels have changed. And so you can see in the graph there, you know, it's sort of fluctuated, um, you know, between 200 and 300 uh, parts per million in the atmosphere over um, a, you know, over the course of, uh, you know, a million years. Um, but uh, in that whole time period, uh, it's never exceeded 300 uh, parts per million, um, except for in the last, um, in the last 50 years, and in particular the last uh, uh, 20 years, measured carbon dioxide in our atmosphere has risen from uh, you know 300 to 350 to it's currently approaching 420 parts per million. So the speed and the magnitude uh, of this rise uh, really doesn't have uh, a precedent. So we're really altering the composition of the atmosphere uh, quite quickly, and that's contributing or causing uh, the climate change that we are seeing. Um, any questions or comments sort of on those first few introductory slides, just covering uh, the ABC of climate there? Um, let's pause there for a second if anybody's got anything that they would like to comment on or ask. If not, we'll get into a little bit on the modeling side. Okay, uh, so where do climate models uh, enter the discussion? So and what are models and what can we do with them? So climate models are essentially just a simulation of the climate system. So they're um, climate, the models provide projections. And so based on a given set of inputs, including uh, the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that uh, humans put into the atmosphere and the resulting concentrations of uh, carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So the climate models will provide information on uh, what we expect to happen within the climate system. So uh, early climate models were relatively simple. Uh, they accounted for basic features of the atmosphere and the ocean. Uh, and as our understanding, uh, as well as our computing power uh, has increased, uh, the models took into account more factors. So current climate models include uh, a lot of different components of information, everything from ice sheets and uh, marine ecosystems and land cover to aerosols within the atmosphere as well. So they take into account more of those details to give us uh, a better picture uh, of a complex uh, climate system. So what do those uh, what do those models do is that they calculate those projected changes based on uh, the changes in the climate system. So future climate projections are then compared against a historical baseline period to determine uh, what we expect to happen in any given scenario. So we typically talk about 20 to 30 year time periods uh, to represent average climate conditions. So we might say, you know, what are the climate conditions uh, historically or, you know, during a previous uh, you know, climate period. So say the 20 year period from, you know, uh, 1980 to 2010 or the 30 year period from 1980 to 2010, and then look at uh, what those average climate conditions might be in a future period from 2040 to 2070, or maybe from 2070 to 2100. Let's typically compare um, 20 to 30 year time periods. So right now there are over 40 global climate models uh, that are used to develop climate projections, uh, and those are the projections that we use uh, to help inform adaptation measures, assessment of impacts, um, and adaptation plans. Okay, so as mentioned, those, those models really start up at the global level, um, so they look sort of at the, at the whole atmospheric system and the whole Earth, um, but these models can be linked to uh, smaller uh, or regional, what are called regional climate models. Um, and these provide a little bit more uh, information on a smaller time or smaller geographic scales. So there are uh, different methods to do uh, this, these types of uh, what's called downscaling. So going from that cli global climate model down to a regional climate model. Um, but what's important to note is that, you know, for the global models, it's difficult to represent uh, very specific local geographic features um, and how they influence local weather. So that's just a challenge within a global model. Obviously, if you're modeling the whole Earth system uh, and atmospheric system, it's hard to really get out that nuance of uh, local geographies. 
Um, so that's one use of the downscaling and the um, uh, and the value of the regional climate models. So they can take into account important features like living next door to the Great Lakes, for example. Um, the intergovernmental panel on climate change, um, you know, through uh, their science reviews, uh, has indicated that there is a really good confidence that those downscaling methods uh, add a lot of value in regions with highly variable uh, topography and uh, for various smaller scale phenomena. So just that those uh, just wanted to kind of reiterate that those uh, regional climate models do have a lot of value and a lot of use uh, at the local planning scale. So what about this question of, you know, to what extent uh, can we, you know, trust climate models? We hear a lot about um, uncertainty, certainly uh, in the discussions around, uh, around climate science and climate models. Um, but the question isn't really so much about uncertainty, it's about, you know, how much certainty exists within certain models and how confident we are that those climate uh, models uh, or how confident the climate models are about the range of outputs for any particular climate variable. Um, so it's not just about, um, you know, the individual climate models, it's about the type of thing that you're also trying to, um, trying to provide information on. So obviously some, uh, some variables are harder to predict uh, or harder to um, narrow that range uh, of future uh, outputs than others. So in, when it comes to variables like average or seasonal temperatures, we can provide, uh, or the climate models can provide a lot more certainty, um, uh, you know, in terms of um, the outputs that you're gonna get and what the future scenarios might lead to. Um, and the ranges might be a little bit bigger if you're dealing with really complex variables, um, you know, such as ice storms or increases in uh, very localized extreme events. Um, and obviously, as you go sort of further out in time, um, you know, those ranges of outputs uh, become a little bit larger as well. It's easier to uh, narrow your range of projections for, you know, 2040 and 2050 uh, versus sort of late century, um, you know, just because uh, obviously those um, sources of uncertainty sort of amplify over time. So just to, uh, just to keep that in mind. So in the earlier slide on models, I mentioned um, that the models are generated um, or the models use different uh, inputs uh, to develop uh, projections. So to, to give us those information, uh, give us that information about what the future climate might look like. So those climate scientists and, and many others develop uh, a series of scenarios um, or what they refer to as scenarios uh, to help guide uh, the inputs to the climate models. Um, and it's important to note that these scenarios are not, these scenarios that are generated are not necessarily predictions um, about what is going to happen. Uh, they are uh, a set of scenarios that are inputs to that particular climate model. So in a nutshell, uh, each scenario is a set of possible futures uh, that is created without consideration of the relative likelihood of those happening. Um, so, you know, you could say in one scenario, um, you know, global policy drives down sort of global emissions, uh, the rate of increases of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere slows and it stops accumulating, cost of green technology, uh, you know, is cheap, um, and international countries really cooperate on climate action. So that could be a uh, scenario that leads to, uh, you know, a lower level of climate change and lower level of climate impacts. In another scenario, uh, fossil fuel production, um, you know, continues, um, greenhouse gases continue to accumulate in the atmosphere uh, and emissions continue to rise and that leads to a higher level of impact. So um, these, this range of scenarios um, that are sort of visualized in the, in the graph there. So these range of scenarios um, incorporate both, um, you know, social and economic policy linkages as well as technology information as well as the dynamics of uh, the atmosphere and the climate. So recently, um, new scenarios called shared socioeconomic pathways were created. So you see reference to those there as well. So that's a new set of five different scenarios developed by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, previously, you may have heard of um, representative concentration pathways. So those were RCP scenarios. 
uh, and those were developed and used previously. So uh, those are just two uh, uh, terms when it comes to uh, climate change scenarios. And so those new scenarios guide um, those climate models. So all of the climate modeling groups around the world at the different universities uh, use these scenarios uh, to input into their climate models uh, so we can explore possible future outcomes. Um, so all of that is really just sort of a long-winded and complicated way of explaining the shorthand that there are high emission scenarios um, with greater climate impacts and there are low emission scenarios where the rate and the magnitude of climate impacts uh, is lessened. So it's important to just kind of keep that in mind. And those scenarios uh, aren't tied to likelihood. Nobody's saying uh, scenario A is more likely than scenario B. Um, it's just uh, those range of inputs, uh, and then you can make decisions on how those are used. Um, okay, so let's, um, are there any questions on, uh, you know, that very short uh, primer on climate models and scenarios? If not yet, then uh, we'll just go quickly over or we'll move along to uh, some of the different tools. Um, okay, so there's a wide variety of different climate change tools that are available out there um, to help you access and navigate climate data and climate projections. Um, and they can range from you know, very accessible and simplified um, just to help you kind of get a sense of how things are changing or how things might change. Uh, to inform planning, to inform communication. Uh, and there are a lot that are increasingly detailed uh, and complex uh, where you can access and download climate data uh, so that they can be used to, uh, to be input in design or uh, your own climate models or your own, uh, your own modeling exercises uh, where you might be wanting to include uh, particular climate variables. So we'll just go over um, a few of those in the next few slides, just to give you an understanding of what's out there and what they might be used for. So the Canadian Centre for Climate Services um, is that uh, federal government uh, dedicated uh, team with expertise across a broad range of climate related disciplines with the goal of helping uh, Canadians uh, increase their resilience to climate change. So, uh, this uh, Climate Services Center was established as part of the Pan-Canadian Framework on uh, Clean Growth and Climate Change, um, which I believe in, in 2017, 2018 was sort of the primary overarching uh, policy and strategy for climate action across Canada. Uh, and this is one of the um, outputs there uh, was to provide Canadians uh, with more information and more access uh, to climate data to support their, uh, their work on adaptation and resilience. So one of the tools, uh, one of the first tools that they came out with is, was called Climate Atlas. Um, so this is a really good sort of high level tool. It is an um, easy to access summary of climate in different uh, regions geographically. Um, so you can select for region and it will provide you with uh, some good uh, visualizations on a number of different climate variables um, uh, so that you can use those uh, to uh, improve your understanding of how climate has changed and how climate will change uh, based on a couple of different emissions scenarios. Um, okay, so Climate Atlas, uh, very good for qualitative uh, work, uh, really useful for informing planning, uh, informing, you know, sort of public engagement, um, provides a very good summary of how climate is changing in a particular region, uh, really good visualizations that can be integrated into your work. Uh, and importantly, it's also really easy to navigate and use. So uh, that's what you can uh, expect. And we may uh, have time as we go through our exercise later to actually navigate over to uh, Climate Atlas and, and use some of that to see what's available there. But I uh, encourage you to do that on your own time as well. ClimateData.ca uh, is the next tool. So it adds an additional layer of detail. So it can be uh, more specific. It provides more information um, on a number, uh, on a greater number of particular variables. Uh, it also has breakdowns based on sector. 
um, and can link uh, the frequency of specific events, uh, things like heat waves uh, and that sort of information. So uh, it can really uh, provide more information that can be integrated into things like uh, risk and vulnerability assessments. Uh, it maintains some of those uh, good accessibility features. Um, so it is um, you know, manageable and easy enough to navigate, uh, provides really great visuals for those outputs, provides a little bit more detail, but it's sort of that next step up in terms of the layer of detail. Um, so uh, just to be aware that that tool is also there um, and it does have uh, sector specific data like agriculture. So it, it will have variables that are uh, kind of designed uh, in response to you know, consultations with you know ag sector. Um, so it's trying to provide information that's relevant to the sector. The next tool is called Pavix. Uh, and so this one is sort of the last uh, or the third one uh, that was kind of released and developed by Environment and Climate Change Canada and the Climate Services Center there. And so it adds uh, another further level of detail. So this is sort of the expert level um, when it comes to climate data. Uh, so Pavix is called Power Analytics and Visualization for Climate Science. So uh, it was part of that national suite of the data tools, but this really is more that sort of expert level tool. So if you're looking to integrate climate data in your uh, design or modeling, I, you know, maybe you're inputting specific climate data variables within a hydrological model uh, to get uh, a better sense of outputs um, and influences on climate influences on hydrology. Um, then you might be using Pavix uh, to access and integrate uh, detailed climate data. Uh, you know, uh, so that's the kind of tool that, or the, the kind of user that might be accessing this one. So this is uh, definitely targeted more towards that sort of expert uh, audience when it comes to climate data. Okay, so outside uh, outside of Environment and Climate Change Canada at the federal level, uh, there are a number of uh, sort of regional data centers. So just wanted to highlight a few of those uh, here. Um, so out on the West Coast, the Pacific Climate Impacts Consortium uh, provides a lot of really good data. Uh, the Prairie Climate Center uh, as well does. Um, there are also Ontario-based uh, portals uh, that were developed. Um, so the, on the Ontario Climate Data Portal um, uh, that, you can, that you can see the uh, feature of there. Uh, was developed through uh, York University in Toronto. Um, so it it provides sort of on a more local level, um, regional climate data downscaled to a 10 by 10 uh, kilometer grid uh, and gives you some good information for a couple of different climate sets uh, and climate variables as well. So another place to look if you're going to look for data. Okay. Um, we also have, um, and particularly important for uh, Southern Ontario, uh, is we're pretty close to uh, available data portals uh, that are developed primarily by and for the US audience. So why might we uh, be thinking about going to consult US, uh, US climate data centers? One, uh, the top left graph there just shows uh, the number of climate data stations in Canada uh, that are providing um, accurate measurements of climate data uh, or climate variables uh, across Canada. So those are the weather stations, sort of the weather network of weather stations across the country. So you can see in Canada in that chart that um, the number of weather stations across Canada has actually been decreasing. Um, and there's a much lower density, which you can see in the, the small map uh, on the bottom left of that screen there as well. There's a much lower density of climate data stations uh, in Canada compared to the US. So what that means is there's not quite as much data being input into the climate models uh, for some of the Canadian systems uh, as there is available for some of the US climate models. Because uh, particularly in Southern Ontario, those climate models uh, or just geographically uh, were pretty close to the US. Um, some of those models can uh, be valuable sources of information uh, as well because they do integrate some of that uh, local climate data and uh, information from the weather stations there. So it can help fill some gaps uh, in terms of your, you know, accessing climate data. So uh, just highlighting a couple here uh, in particular. So NOAA um, is sort of the main source of weather and climate information across the U.S. Um, but the one on the bottom there I wanted to highlight was uh, GLISA, uh, which is the Great Lakes Integrated Science and Assessments uh, Center. 
Um, and so that's based um, out of um, one of the universities. I'm forgetting uh, which one off the top of my head. Oh, um, University of Michigan, I believe. That's right. So it's based out of University of Michigan, and it really takes a deep dive uh, into uh, models around the Great Lakes and focuses on that. So historical temperature and precipitation for uh, the Great Lakes Basin, uh, as well as a number of different variables uh, across the Great Lakes Basin. So obviously some good um, relevance for Southern Ontario CAs uh, as well that might be looking for climate information. Okay, um, so that is a um, bit of a snapshot on some of the available climate information and climate data. Um, so just a couple of important considerations when it comes to working with climate data. Um, so whether you're accessing the information yourself, whether you're working with partners or consultants or soliciting data, um, from different sources. Um, it's just important to just always kind of keep in mind what are the scenarios that we're talking about? Um, what are uh, the inputs uh, to that climate data that I'm looking at? Um, how certain are, am I about uh, the different outcomes that are there? Um, and what are uh, some of the limitations? So uh, in, you know, remote or rural uh, or northern areas of Canada, the climate, the number of climate data stations that are providing input are a little bit limited. So, it, um, you know, you, you just have to be sort of aware of that. Um, and then obviously for adaptation and vulnerability assessment, climate data is just one part of any uh, particular risk assessment. So other data sources are, um, are important uh, as part of the process as well, including um, indigenous knowledge. Uh, and Indigenous knowledges, which can provide uh, really valuable insight into long-term uh, local and regional climate, as well as the impacts of that. Quick pause there, and then we'll actually go through what some of these uh, projections are saying. Any um, questions on the models or the scenarios so far? It's making it very easy on me and not making, um, not posing too much in the way of questions so far. All right. Okay. Well, we'll keep going. Um, okay. So, so moving from the data and the models to uh, what they're actually telling us about uh, the trends and projections. Uh, so, uh, in the image, uh, you can see some key indicators of global change. Uh, so, you know, the amount of water vapor in our atmosphere, uh, the temperature over land, ice and snow cover, all of those are, you know, some really high level sort of global indicators of potential climate change. Uh, in a warming climate, we would expect to see increasing or decreasing trends for each of those um, indicators. Um, fairly intuitive that, you know, in a warming climate, we'd see decreasing sea ice and increasing sea level um, because there's more ocean heat um, and in fact this is already what we're observing so all of our current observations and measurements reinforce our expectations of uh, warming and climate modeling uh, so there's a reliable and measurable uh, physical evidence that really supports our understanding of the climate system at the national level um, we do have uh, some really good uh, information and monitoring um, of both uh, trends and projections. So just wanted to kind of point people to uh, this series of reports called uh, Canada's Changing Climate Report. So the first national level report came out in 2019 and there have been um, sub subsequent sort of region, uh, regional specific uh, chapters. So there was an Ontario chapter of this report uh, that came out just last year. Um, but in Canada, um, some highlights from uh, the national level report are that uh, Canada uh, has already warmed um, almost uh, two degrees and almost doubled the global average rate because warming is more pronounced in uh, the northern part of, um, of, the, of the earth. Uh, so, and uh, in the northern part of Canada. Obviously, oceans are warming uh, and becoming more acidic and deoxygenating, so that's affecting sort of marine ecosystems. But water temperatures and lake temperatures are also uh, increasing, which is affecting sort of the freshwater ecosystems as well. Total precipitation um, is projected to increase across Canada uh, with a decrease in snowfall and an increase in rainfall. Uh, and weather extremes are expected to intensify in the future. So the rate and magnitude of climate change. Um, 
under uh, a high emission scenario uh, versus a low emission scenario uh, lead to some uh, potentially very different uh, futures for Canada. So under a higher emission scenario, uh, Canada will experience uh, a much greater amount of warming uh, by late century and that will lead to uh, more serious and more severe impacts. Under a lower emission scenario where we do have success on the mitigation side of both the uh, national and global level, uh, those impacts will be uh, fewer, they will be less severe and they will be more manageable. So they will, um, we are sort of locked in for a number of challenges that we do need to adapt to uh, both, uh, both ends of that spectrum. So when we talk about sort of, uh, you know, uh, average uh, average changes, um, you know, small, what appear, might appear um, to be sort of small changes in average annual temperatures uh, or small changes in, you know, total volumes of annual precipitation. Um, and a, a reaction sort of might be, you know, what difference does, you know, one or two degrees of average temperature actually make? Um, so what that actually does is it kind of shifts over um, the whole uh, average or mean, um, which shifts the frequency and the intensity of some of those extreme uh, events that occur. So you can kind of see that in the, in the oops, sorry. Didn't mean to scroll there. Um, so you can see that uh, within the average uh, or within, within different variability. So if you move that mean temperature over, you see more uh, more frequency of what we currently consider extreme, um, and the very far end of those extremes um, become more severe in magnitude. Um, so, as uh, so, just something to keep in mind when you hear or you think about or when you see information like um, average, uh, you know, seasonal or, uh, or annual temperatures increase by a degree. Um, you know, that's one thing, um, but what it means to those um, you know, extreme events on both the cold and the hot side are important components uh, of what that actually means. Okay, so Ontario's temperature, um, just kind of recapping uh, measured change. So measured change, we talk about uh, the trends uh, and projections. We talk about what those uh, climate models are telling us about uh, particular um, or what the outputs are of the climate models based on different uh, scenarios. So Ontario's temperature has already measurably increased uh, compared to uh, recent baseline periods. Um, and this applies to both averages and for some of those extreme variables like uh, days over 30 degrees. So um, it's important to note that there's a lot of different variability within that as well. So uh, winter temperatures, um, you know, for example, are increasing faster than summer temperatures. Uh, precipitation levels uh, annually are increasing, uh, but a lot of that uh, in, increase is actually concentrated uh, in some of the winter and winter and spring uh, season. So not an uh, even uh, distribution of those annual changes. Uh, so just an example here for Owen Sound, um, the number of days per year over 30 degrees will increase from a, you know, a current value of around eight um, to closer to 20 uh, by mid-century, um, even under a moderate emission scenario. So that's uh, RCP 4.5. So under a higher emission scenario, uh, that would change. And uh, certainly by late century, the difference between a lower emission scenario and a high emission scenario would be even greater. On the precipit precipitation side, we see um, higher and lower levels of change depending on geography. Um, for example, uh, how far north the community is or, or proximity to the Great Lakes. Um, and again, as with temperature being, you know, not evenly distributed over the course of the year, um, most of the increase in precipitation is winter and fall, uh, and temperature increases are more pronounced in the winter. So, so far in Ontario, we've seen uh, that precipitation has increased uh, and more in some areas than others. Um, and there's also that seasonal variability. Um, so there's been close to an 8% increase in observed uh, precipitation between 1980 um, and the in the kind of midpoint of last uh, the last decade, and a four and a half percent increase in that uh, in summer, 
only four and a half percent of that increase was in summer and nearly 25 percent increase in winter precipitation. Uh, so much more uh, change in the winter precipitation than the summer. And the other, uh, the other change of worth note there is that more precipitation is falling as rain and not snow. Um, so it's changing the dynamic and the type of precipitation as well. Okay, um, so as we mentioned earlier, some climate indices like those annual averages or seasonal averages might be a little bit easier to discern that change and to provide projections than others. Complex events like freezing rain, um, you know, pose unique challenges in terms of, um, you know, uh, their projections. Um, but based on related trends like moisture conditions, temperature trends, and more, climatologists are telling us that there's likely to be an increase in both the frequency and the severity of ice storms. Um, so when it comes to infrastructure and freezing rain, um, important to note that, um, you know, it's not sort of a linear relationship between the amount of uh, ice that accumulates and the damage uh, that occurs. Once you pass a certain threshold, you really start to see things breaking, unfortunately. Um, so once you get above a, a particular threshold, you see uh, you see more of those uh, more of those failures, the power outages, and that sort of thing. Um, and climatologists are telling us uh, that we do expect to see more of that. Uh, similar, uh, similarly, uh, wind speed and damage are not linear. So above again, above certain thresholds, damage really increases very uh, in, uh, rapidly. Um, so um, small increases in wind extremes uh, have the potential to uh, result in large increases in damages. Um, uh, so when it comes to projections for Ontario, uh, we are expecting longer tornado seasons, uh, potential for stronger wind gusts, uh, specifically during storms and thunderstorms. Um, and uh, that may cause some challenges on the adaptation side as well. Paul, there was a question from the Ontario precipitation slide. Um, Mark was asking what model these projections are based on. Um, go back to that. Um, I believe uh, those uh, those graphics in particular, I think we've pulled data from a couple of different things there for some of my points there, uh, but those graphics in particular were, uh, came out of uh, the report by Maybe Anna can link to it. Um, I think that was a University of Toronto um, author that uh, developed some of those data sets from the Ontario Climate Change Data Portal. There was also a question on from Tara on why Canada is warming quicker than other regions in the world. Um, yeah, it's just sort of the um, the way sort of uh, you know, the, the climate interacts is that sort of globally, as you approach either the north or the south pole, uh, those uh, changes in magnitude are, the changes in magnitude of, you know, average climate variables increase. Um, so, you know, Canada is warming faster than the United States uh, on average. Um, and, you know, that's uh, common with other sort of northern uh, countries as well. So, um, so you know, the magnitude of change, you know, globally is, you know, sort of an average of one degree warmer. Um, if you look sort of over the landmass of Canada, you know, you might, that might average out at, you know, one and a half to two degrees warmer. Um, but up in the Arctic um, and towards the North Pole, average um, annual changes are already three or four degrees warmer uh, than historical averages. So those changes are happening a little bit faster and they're of greater magnitude um, the further you go away from the equator. I hope that uh, that helps um, answer those questions, but uh, let me know if that wasn't sufficient. <laughs> okay, um, so when it comes to uh, other regional variables, um, changes uh, within the Great Lakes region as well. Um, so lake effects note uh, is sort of obviously important uh, um, locally uh, when it comes to um, you know weather events and extremes. So the combination of you know increased water temperature within the Great Lakes, uh, decreased ice cover, um, both the extent and the length of the ice cover uh, season, 
as well as changes in regional weather patterns really means that there's going to be or there is a projected increase in uh, lake effect snow events. Um, so the relationship between you know those ice cover um, uh, those different variables are leading to uh, those potential uh, uh, increased severity and frequency of high impact uh, winter events. Uh, and, you know, changes in ice cover have other impacts as well from shoreline erosion um, to impacts, uh, you know, shoreline erosion and impacts in aquatic species as well. So um, lots of different sort of dynamics that happen with uh, the changes of ice cover. Great Lakes water levels are also affected by changes in factors, including precipitation and evaporation rates. So uh, that dynamic between increasing precipitation and increasing temperature is kind of um, influencing both the amount of water that's getting to the Great Lakes as well as the evaporation from the Great Lakes. Um, so uh, a complex um, piece uh, to kind of provide, uh, you know, climate information and projections around, but. Uh, the climate and hydrology projections for the region indicate, um, you know, some higher lake levels, but also much greater variability. So you may uh, want to expect both lower lows, um, greater variability, uh, and potentially higher highs uh, within some of the Great Lakes basins. Uh, Paul, question in the chat: Is increasing warming affecting even remote lakes in terms of blue-green algae? Um, yes, uh, I think so. I mean, you know, across Canada, there are, are some pretty good data sets. Um, I'm not sure if Anna has any access to them or could point us to some of that research, but I know that the water temperature um, across the fresh, uh, across the lakes, you know, across Ontario and across Canada, the freshwater lakes, they've been kind of keeping an eye on that. And it's certainly the water temperatures are increasing uh, and the ice cover is decreasing. And all of those contribute to um, or, you know, enable um, blue-green algae events. Um, obviously, there are other inputs to blue-green algae. Um, so it depends probably on the local levels, but obviously the warmer water temperatures are certainly uh, contributing to and enabling more of uh, blue-green algae events for sure. And other dynamics like uh, higher intensity precipitation events. So those extreme uh, rain events are in some cases kind of flushing uh, more into the lakes, um, which uh, kind of can feed some of those uh, blue green algae events as well. I'm based, uh, I'm based uh, up in Northeastern Ontario and kind of Temiskaming Shores region. So pretty close to the Quebec border. And uh, you know, we've been getting uh, blue green algae events up here uh, as well uh, recently. So they're certainly occurring all the way up here too. So. Um, less, uh, less immediately relevant potentially for, uh, you know, parts of uh, Southern Ontario, um, where there's a little bit less in the way of uh, wildfire risk and uh, forest cover, but uh, across Ontario, uh, there is certainly a, an increase in wildfire risk. Um, it's most pronounced in the Northwest, um, but it is common across Ontario, um, more of a potential wildfire risk. Um, and, you know, relevant for Southern Ontario that can really contribute to uh, air quality advisories as well. Okay, so uh, just a quick recap before we um, move along to uh, Anna's part of the presentation. So it's warmer already, um, and by mid-century, uh, those changes are going to be amplified even further, uh, and even further again by late century. Uh, late century um, outcomes really do depend uh, a lot on uh, the success we have in mitigating climate change, so reducing fossil fuel use, and projecting those carbon sinks. Um, changes in temperature and precipitation averages and annual totals tell part of the story, um, but it's important that you keep in mind the seasonal variation, so uh, warmer winters, wetter winters, drier summers. Keep in mind the changes in variability, uh, as well as the changes in extremes and extreme events. Um, so Canada has uh, already warmed and will continue to do so. Um, Impacts don't occur in isolation. Um, so risks and impacts are really sort of interconnected and overlapping. Um, and we need to uh, begin and accelerate the extent to which we are kind of um, 
understanding uh, the way climate um, you know, poses a threat to um, all sectors, including the agricultural sector. Um, and we need to kind of start integrating that into our uh, planning across all of those sectors as well. All right, I think just to uh, make sure everybody's on their toes, we do have a quick little um, poll uh, and then we'll take a short break uh, and then come back for more on climate hazards and impacts. All right, so quick quiz, just to uh, make sure everybody was kind of paying attention anyway. Another few seconds, both last answers in. All right. Okay, so that first one, um, bit of a trick question. Uh, most of you got it though. So um, do climate models provide accurate predictions about future weather? Bit of a trick question. Uh, that one's actually false because um, the climate models um, are providing projections about future conditions based on those different scenarios. But those scenarios, uh, importantly, are not uh, predictions necessarily about, about what will happen. Um, so we have to uh, kind of keep that in mind. There are uh, lower emission scenarios and higher emission scenarios. Um, and all of that depends on um, uh, you know, both the combination of the dynamics of the climate system, uh, as well as all of the inputs like climate policy and our success in reducing um, and mitigating against climate change. Uh, so that first one, uh, false, just because of that little dynamic there. Uh, the second one, I think pretty much, uh, actually everybody got that one right. Um, so yeah, those uh, climate data sources from the US can certainly be used. Um, to inform uh, the work that you're doing in the Southern Ontario region primarily. Um, and on the last question, uh, changes in temperature and precipitation are expected to be most pronounced in winter. And yeah, that is true. Um, so um, very good, everybody, thanks. Okay, um, so I think we're taking a short break here, Anna, is that correct? We're gonna take five minutes um, and then come uh, back for the next session? Yeah, maybe two to three minutes. Two to three minutes. Just All to right. make sure we stay within, yeah, uh, the fun time. So um, yeah, so back at uh, 2.05 to go over um, climate hazards and impacts and some um, elements of the risk assessment process before we dive into the, uh, the group assignment, group activity. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Paul.
All right, so we're um, we're going to resume. Thank you very much, Paul, for um, presenting the slides, going over them. Um, some significant and diverse impacts from climate change are being experienced in Ontario, and in this section, we'll review the major types of impacts, focusing on the ones that are of most importance to agriculture, and specifically in Grey Bruce and Huron counties. Infrastructure impacts are uh, some of the prominent ones when we think about climate change. Um, more intense rainfalls, uh, snow and ice storms are responsible for um, numerous infrastructure impacts, including uh, loss of roads, airport and bridge assets, um, premature infrastructure deterioration, um, water treatment, wastewater treatment issues, widespread power outages, um, risks of building collapse, transportation delays, uh, as well as uh, safety and emergency risks. Um, as an example, and what you can see in the image on the left there, um, that's Finch Avenue that was um, um, severely affected by the 2005 uh, storm that beat all records in Canada for hourly intense rainfall at 153 millimeters of rain uh, falling uh, in a span of three hours, where a 78 meter stretch of Finch Avenue was uh, cratered, uh, the Black Creek culvert collapsed, um, and also all the different uh, utilities, gas, um, um, and others were uh, were damaged with uh, uh, the financial tally um, ranking as uh, the most uh, one of the most expensive natural disasters in province's history, um, over six hundred million in insurance payouts. Um, the Great Ice Storm of 1998, um, as seen uh, in the other image, lasted five days with over 100 millimeters of freezing rain and ice pallets um, uh, falling over that period with um, the state of emergency being declared and severe um, damages to infrastructure as well as casualties uh, occurring. Higher temperatures and stronger winds um, can also impact infrastructure, leading to compromised structural safety, damage to buildings, utilities infrastructure, um, premature deterioration, as well as shifts in energy and cooling demands. Changes in uh, climate and also the environment have direct and indirect impacts on our health. Um, with a wide variety of health impacts, including uh, increases in, uh, in certain infectious diseases, such as tick-borne diseases, physical and mental health risks um, associated with extreme events like flooding um, due to displacement and damage to homes and loss of uh, savings that can have long-term impacts. Other impacts come from uh, extreme heat, air quality, um, And importantly here, um, we should know that the equity gap is increasing and over uh, the past 30 years, indicators show that the gap between poor and wealthy people is widening in terms of health outcomes and climate change is likely to um, further increase the gap in the coming decades. Extensive ecosystem impacts are linked to climate change and uh, those include uh, changes in the timing of natural cycles, Species range shifts, decreases in lake ice cover, shorter ice cover seasons, as well as increased prevalence of invasive species and more frequent pest outbreaks. For agriculture, uh, climate change could bring new opportunities, um, such as longer growing and grazing seasons, um, increased yields, the potential to grow new crop species. Uh, and at the same time, it could also put pressure on agricultural ecosystems, damaging crops and infrastructure and resulting in increased production costs, soil and water quality degradation. Some of the other um, negative impacts include uh, increased disease susceptibility of plants, increased mortality of livestock, winter tree injury, uh, soil erosion, nutrient depletion, increased irrigation demands, and so forth. 
major drivers of agricultural impacts in the region, so Graebers and Huron counties, as well as other regions in southern Ontario include uh, drought, heavy precipitation and flooding, extreme heat, uh, and also spring and fall frost and variable winter weather. Major impacts uh, that are coming as a result of these drivers um, were identified and are shown here um, for relevant agricultural sector components like uh, um, water and soil, field crops, farm operations. As an example, drought impacts are primarily experienced by field crops, soil and water resources, and they are manifested uh, by delays in plant development, reduced yield and nutritional value, declines in uh, soil suitability to support crop growth, also poor nutrient uptake, increased water contamination, uh, and low water levels that lead to greater irrigation demands and higher production costs. Heavy precipitation and flooding um, affect farm operations by uh, damaging infrastructure and fill crops, as well as also soil and water resources. With the severity and frequency of heavy precipitation and flooding um, uh, having increased um, in the region lately due to uh, shifting spring snowmelt regimes, increasing rain and snow events, and uh, more long duration heavy precipitation events, as well as short duration intense storms. Spring and fall frost um, results in cold damage to fruit trees, perennial and annual crops, and then compromised fall hardening of um, uh, certain uh, crops and reduced yield. Uh, extreme heat is a hazard that's of particular concern for livestock that potentially results in um, decreased feed intake, um, lower weight gain, milk production for dairy cattle, and increased mortality. And for crops, the impacts include uh, heat stress, higher susceptibility to diseases, and reduced yields as well. Variable winter weather and also fall weather, generally weather during the shoulder seasons, uh, compromises um, fall hardening, increases sensitivity of crops, such as alfalfa and other forages, also winter wheat to freezing temperatures. And similarly, fruit trees are more prone to winter injury and ultimately reduced yield. Warmer weather during winter, which we have been seeing uh, more frequently, also increases chances of pest survival, and that in turn causes increases in pesticide application, higher production costs, and greater chances of uh, soil and water contamination. We will now look into um, assessing risk, vulnerabilities, and opportunities. Um, what steps um, could be done to um, to do that, so to refresh from earlier today, um, a risk assessment helps us understand potential risks, and it's a uh, formal systematic process of estimating the level of risk, considering the probability and the consequences of exposure to a hazard or threat um, to help inform decision making. And it also may include an estimate of vulnerabilities and how risk might change if we add strategies to mitigate or manage or reduce risk. So in this section here, we'll review the main elements of your risk assessment and some results of the uh, original ag assessment work that was conducted. Now, why do we need to assess risk? It's um, uh, risk is an assessment of um, the potential for loss or gain in a given situation. Um, hazard risk focuses on um, potential loss or damage of an asset from a hazard like flooding or tornadoes. And um, communities would typically conduct hazard risk assessment as part of their emergency management. Risk assessment provides value to decision makers by giving clarity about who or what may be at risk. And it also allows prioritization of responses and resource allocation. And importantly, it can be uh, assessed both uh, quantitatively uh, with numeric values and qualitatively in a descriptive non numerical classification. Uh, risk assessment is one of the components of adaptation planning, and um, they're a practical tool, as I mentioned, to understand what or who is at risk. Um, 
importantly, understanding risk also requires engagement and the need to understand people's values and their perceptions of risks. Uh, the key steps in a risk assessment process include uh, defining the problem, like what it is that we're considering, looking at hazards, what are the hazards in the scenarios that we're looking at, um, looking at exposure, uh, what is the exposure of the receptor to the hazard, and then the consequence of that exposure. And finally, um, defining what is this risk and what are the options to mitigate the risk. Um, some general uh, considerations that are applicable to multiple steps are um, communication and documentation of your work um, and process using existing resources and local knowledge to the extent possible and ensuring um, continued education and awareness with the audience. So in Gray, Bruce, and Huron agricultural risk assessment, we did engage with uh, local stakeholders and ask them questions about their experience with weather, climate, and any issues that they have experienced or anticipate in the future. Um, weather variability was a common trend that was mentioned. And while farmers have um, always needed to adapt to natural weather cycles, conditions are becoming more variable and extreme over time. For example, many have noted that in recent years, they have experienced flash flooding followed by drought conditions. And this variability makes it harder to plan and can mean that there's uh, less time to get everything done. Many um, have also noted frequent and intense storms, high winds, greater prevalence of uh, pests, changes in pest distributions, as well as um, warming temperatures, earlier frost. Um, in fall, later spring frost, an, increase, an increased number of freeze-thaw cycles. As we discussed uh, weather and climate changes, the most frequently referenced area of concern was water management that encompassed a lot of different impacts, like increased runoff, legacy phosphorus and flooding. We frequently heard about soil erosion and poor soil health, including impacts to topsoil and nutrient losses. Um, some of the areas of concern overlap um, with the climate and weather impacts that were noted. For example, drought conditions that occur during the growing se season or flooding events leading to increased erosion. Having identified major hazards and impacts in our assessment, we used um, information about climate variables, ag sector components and vulnerabilities to develop um, 26 risk scenarios that were then assessed uh, for the degree of current and future risks. This scenario is consider how a climate hazard can cascade to direct and indirect impacts for different subsectors. Components uh, can be impacted in different ways by climate extremes um, and uh, climate events in general. Um, so different uh, thresholds were used in scenarios vulnerability to climate change and therefore risk associated with climate change um, is a composite of multiple factors for and for each of the scenarios um, sensitivity factors were documented and that factors are what um, determines the level of vulnerability of the agricultural sector components that are shown at the top so livestock fruit and vegetables soil water um, to various climate hazards that are displayed at the bottom. As an example, um, crop sensitivity to hazards is determined by the timing and length of exposure, as well as growth stage and cultivar type, with higher yielding cultivars being more susceptible to drought damage uh, due to their greater evapotranspiration demands, for example. Poorly managed soils and soils with lower density are more likely to be adversely affected by drought conditions. Soils on greater slopes are more vulnerable to erosion caused by heavy precipitation events and proximity of fields uh, to water bodies also determines the level of potential water contamination by um, 
runoff during, uh, during heavy rainfall. For all of the scenarios, we have uh, recorded adaptation strategies and risk solutions that range from um, incremental adjustments of existing practices to some major alterations that transform the entire farm operation. Some examples of these measures include uh, planting new crop cultivars using irrigation technologies, crop rotation and conservation tillage, um, rotational grazing, installing cooling and ventilation systems in barns, as well as um, tile drainage and uh, adjusting the timing of farming operations. So once the scenarios have been developed, we have assigned the likelihood of each event occurring uh, and the consequence of that impact. And the magnitude of risk was the product of the likelihood of a hazard occurring and the severity of consequence. And you can see that we looked at historic and future time periods and different um, types of consequence, including financial losses, environmental damage, infrastructure damage, and human health and public safety. Overall, uh, what we found that was that uh, the number of high-risk scenarios has increased significantly, while moderate risks have declined. Um, the majority of risks are associated with uh, heavy precipitation events, uh, drought, and extreme heat. And so looking at these uh, a bit more Closely, significant increases in heavy precipitation and flooding um, were found to affect uh, field crops, farm operations, infrastructure, and soil and water resources. With uh, precipitation events with daily amounts of up to 30 millimeters being experienced during the growing season and uh, causing increased runoff, leaching of nutrients and chemicals, water contamination, degraded soil quality and then um, causing delays to planting and harvesting operations as well. Rising air temperatures and a greater uh, number of heat waves have been occurring in the region in the past decades and are almost certain to persist and intensify in the future. And that's all consistent with the moderate and high risk scores for heat related scenarios that affect um, crops and livestock in the region. Dry conditions during summer months also um, adversely affect a number of uh, components of the ag sector, including water resources and soil quality with implications for field crops and livestock, Financial losses due to crop damage, environmental degradation, and public health concerns are some of the main consequences that contribute to overall risk scores that are moderate and high in the future and largely, uh, I mean, at the present and largely high in the future time period. Through our engagement, one of the things um, that we wanted to hear is about um, um, what is um, currently being used by um, stakeholders to understand uh, climate and weather and what uh, additional products could be of use and help to the stakeholders. So the number one takeaway was uh, that information on risk needs to be supported with information on solutions that I have uh, already mentioned. And so uh, we have identified uh, three main objectives that the products uh, that were made could help achieve. So one is uh, raise awareness of the issues, then um, support planning and design, and finally support implementation adaptation of uh, um, best management practices and resilience measures. The proposed uh, risk products that were produced include the risk registry, a case study series on um, successful implementation of best management practices, uh, and uh, risk registry infographics on the changing climate and then major hazards and risks. 
it's important to remember here that uh, risk assessments, they won't necessarily uh, tell us exactly what to do and how to reduce risk, but they are a good starting point um, to make informed decisions about adaptation. They can help us understand how much risk we can deal with and also who and what is more vulnerable to risk, whether we can lower any of the risks through adaptation strategies and which of the strategies are most uh, cost-effective and beneficial. Having looked at the uh, main components and some results of risk assessment activities, um, it's also important um, uh, to frame that uh, within the context of uh, that we need to get uh, moving on the actual measures to build resilience and to help us adapt and um, how to plan um, for that adaptation. And here, taking an integrated approach um, is important. Remembering that climate data isn't uh, the only input that we need. In addition to that, um, there should be understanding of um, uh, who or what is exposed to a potential hazard, um, how sensitive um, exposed um, assets um, or people are to um, climate change and how they will be affected by it in the future, whether there are important thresholds, what are the consequences, and so forth. So all together, this uh, helps us describe um, vulnerability and takes us to um, defining the capacity to adapt and um, cope with the with the impacts and implement adaptation measures and monitoring. Importantly, um, we should remember that adaptation um, can occur on a project by project and day to day basis um, without a uh, large scale comprehensive plan. And it can, of course, complement. So day-to-day -day actions, project-by-project -project actions can complement comprehensive plans. So as I mentioned, an integrated approach to uh, adaptation planning is critical. And, but like all planning, adaptation should also be uh, cyclical and iterative. So it's important to always seek to incorporate new information, to monitor, observe, learn and adjust. New climate information, once it becomes available, should be evaluated against the plan or against the um, adaptation me measures that are in place to see if any of the responses need to be accelerated. Measuring the effectiveness of any action or policy can inform if um, the strategy is working whether or not um, risk tolerance has changed, um, whether adaptation measures are sufficient, and if there are any other conditions in addition to climate that can affect um, risk tolerance. So importantly, um, the key messages are that we should uh, begin any kind of uh, planning and assessment of risks with the end in mind thinking about what specifically the information will be used for and what level of detail of the information will be required to enable the actions. Equipping yourself with the right tools and selecting appropriate frameworks for your assessment is important. And lastly, um, always enabling the implementation of results and considering what it will take and how um, any um, unclear risks, uh, opportunities, and um, resilience building actions can be avoided, as well as um, identifying support roles and timing and costs throughout the process. So before, um, we dive into the group activity. I will pause in case um, there are any questions coming from the chat.
Yeah, and I think Rita was asking if there was a way to access the infographics. I'm not sure if um, there are yes. links to those. Or... Um, I can we can share the uh, the links to infographics as well. They are available. Yeah. So we will share those along with um, the slides and the recording. For the group activity, so we have about uh, half an hour um, in our um, allocated uh, session left. So uh, the way the group activity will unfold is as follows. Uh, I will uh, introduce a um, fictional scenario to you that would require um, some reflection and completion of two tasks on uh, finding and interpreting climate data to support stewardship activities and increase agricultural resilience. Um, once I have introduced this scenario, we will split into two groups um, uh, where you'll be asked to join a breakout room where a facilitator will be on, on hand to assist with the two tasks. And then um, we will, uh, once we're back in the, in the large group, we will uh, share the results, the answers to the tasks, and discuss what the, the outcomes that we have found are. So for this scenario, uh, imagine that you are an employee of an agricultural stewardship organization um, in Gray County, Ontario, and you have been tasked with developing a program or a series of workshops to raise awareness about climate risks and vulnerabilities and support planning and implementation of resilience measures and best management practices. Over the past years, you have engaged with local farmers to learn from their knowledge and their experience of farming uh, about the effects of severe weather and climate change on operations and main changes that they have observed and key farming concerns are summarized below. So the key, um, key changes include more frequent and intense storms, pests, freeze thaw cycles, shifting frost season, variability, high winds, winter rain, then drought, and warming temperatures. With the main concerns being uh, linked to soil erosion and drought conditions as well as a loss of biodiversity and lack of weather predictability, issues with water management and soil health, and then followed by infrastructure, resilience, heat stress, and also change in lake levels, which were mentioned. So once um, we go to the breakout rooms, these are the, uh, the tasks that are um, in front of you. So task one is to reflect on the case study, the scenario, and discuss key changes in climate and weather patterns, and also which hazards you think are most likely to change and be impactful to agricultural operations in the region now and in the future. Once you've um, talked about that, um, would go to uh, the Climate Atlas of Canada and explore how um, climate is going to change in Gray County. So specifically, um, under precipitation tab, we'll be looking at summaries and graphs for heavy precipitation days and comparing changes between different seasons, time periods, and uh, greenhouse gas emission scenarios. And if time allows, we will um, compare findings with data available on uh, climatedata.ca and discuss the implications that spatial resolution has on the data. All right. Uh, welcome back, everyone. I think we have all uh, we're all in, in the main uh, the main group now. 
hoping there were some um, productive discussions. I know we definitely discussed the key um, the key hazards and changes in them, and also looked at um, we're able to explore the heavy precipitation data on both um, Climate Atlas and ClimateData.ca to to see what the differences are in how what data are available. So in the last few minutes, just briefly, so what um, were the key trends that we reviewed in the portal? So if somebody could uh, report or maybe maybe a facilitator. Yeah, we didn't, uh, we spent a little bit of time on uh, Climate Atlas, uh, just looking at some of the different variables uh, that were available, um, but we didn't get over to climatedata.ca yet um, and didn't really get too much into some of the trends that were available there. So um, we just kind of navigated around Climate Atlas a little bit, but um, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what you guys went into in your breakout. Yeah, what, uh, what we saw is that, uh... We did look at different um, uh, spatial scale of data, uh, kind of like the coarser scale versus the smaller grid, and definitely saw the differences in um, some parts of the region showing more pronounced increases in uh, heavy precipitation day days. The variable we looked at, we were able to go to uh, climatedata.ca and there um, the resolution is even um, finer. So there were differences. And uh, yeah, we did look at uh, how the variable is different across different seasons, kind of like annually versus summer and versus fall. And there were, were changes, changes there as well. Does anybody have uh, comments on how the data could be applied in assessing and addressing risks and vulnerabilities? What's the time? I know uh, in our group we kind of like we talked about the changes and looked at the data, but there wasn't enough time to dive into the the application side of things. But if anybody has any thoughts or considerations. Yeah, we had we had some um, we had some good comments from Nathan on how he's been using some of the climate data uh, to inform uh, mostly infrastructure risk assessment work that uh, that he's been doing. Um, and I know he's got a question for you that he might ask offline about um, linking some of the available data to uh, mapping. So I think he'll mm -hmm. probably send you that afterwards. For sure. um, yeah. Um, so we had uh, a good example there from Nathan. So that was nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you discuss any possible challenges in using the data? Like any issues that could come up and um, maybe any, someone can think about um, some suggestions any. from the group or any, we didn't get to that in our, during the breakout, mm -hmm. but. Um, any just um, just general questions either on the scenario or on the use of uh, those climate data uh, pieces uh, or on any any parts of the presentation or the risk assessment um, that uh, that Anna led for the region. Yeah, if there are um, no questions now, you're most welcome to um, to send an email uh, with questions, kind of as a as a follow up. Uh, and I will be sharing the uh, the slide deck and the infographics. I would uh, now like to thank all of you for for being here, for your interest in our work, and for the questions. Um, uh, um, before uh, disconnecting, please uh, take a minute to complete uh, a survey. Uh, and I would ask Alyssa to please drop a, drop a link in the chat. It's um, it's a short one and should really take uh, 
just a couple of minutes uh, to complete and your feedback would be most appreciated and help us improve our future sessions and um, tailor them to you to learners key needs. Excellent. All right. Otherwise, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us uh, today. And uh, yeah, we definitely appreciate your feedback um, through the short survey there. And feel free to reach out if anybody's got uh, or if you have questions. Yes. Thanks, uh, everyone. Thanks, Paul and Alyssa, for helping with the presentation. Hope everyone has a great day. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Bye.